Good afternoon, Australia, place Sydney. Yeah, that's a place. I'm Daniel, and welcome to another episode of Have a Good One. Huh? <gasps> Alright, so. I have recently uh, watched Frozen the Musical. What? I'm allowed to. I don't care if it's conveyed as being a kid's show. I don't care. It's not... It's not that I knew anyone in the show and it was actually a really exciting thing for everyone involved in it. And so I went to support them. Nothing like that. I just watched it. And also, as I was watching it, I realized that I could make a video about this, so... Hey, look at that. I mean, wait, no, I was planning on making a video of this from the start, which is why I watched this. Because it's a kid's show, how could I watch it anyway? So, for those of you who don't know about Frozen, I'm actually kind of impressed. Like, how? How'd you manage? Anyway, the musical Frozen is obviously based on the 2013 animated movie, uh, Frozen. Which, I don't know, you might, you might have never heard of it, you know, it's not, the movie's not super well known, it's a, it's a bit of a niche market and all that, uh, you know, it's, uh, not, I don't think a huge amount of people know it, like, uh, what was it? Uh, apparently, it was the highest grossing animated film of all time. And in fact, I think it still is. Uh, as well as being the fifth highest grossing movie of all time at some point. Okay, hold up. Never mind, I'm mistaken. Frozen is no longer the highest grossing animated film. Uh, it's been, it's since been overtaken by Frozen 2 and the... 2019 remake of The Lion King. Meanwhile, the actual Lion King is in 12th now. <sighs> Minions is 5th! How is Minions 5th? Okay, anyway... <sighs> With that out of the way, the musical is also... So, the musical came out in 2018... No, 2017 originally in Denver. Uh, and then it came out on Broadway in 2018. Then did a US tour in 2019. Uh, obviously, because of certain things that happened during that year... That year... Uh, they had to suspend performances, but apparently they're doing an Australian tour of it. So, that's pretty cool. Good to know that they managed to make it through that. But anyway, so... At this point, pr most people know about... Fro it's certainly a more well-known story than Pippin these days, so... I don't think I'll really go that heavily into the plot because I think most people already know what it's about or I don't know maybe nothing will change but for those of you who don't know I did a video on Pippin before and what it was all about was I looked at it looked at the morality the morals that the story shows and what the how well that morality how well those morals are upheld in modern times I'm imagining that this is going to be, this is going to hold up, like, decently well, because obviously Frozen is a much more recent story than Pippin, so it would reflect the current times closer, I would imagine. Anyway, um, so, the opening scene of, uh, Frozen opens with Elsa and Anna, uh, playing around in their bedrooms. They ended up skipping the opening scene in the movie. Oh, yeah, also, it's probably worth mentioning that I'll draw a few comparisons to the movie because, for the most part, the movie and the musical are pretty... Well, they're the same story, obviously. There are, obviously, a few differences. One of them is the opening scene. In the movie, it's like this work song that shows a bunch of ice workers... Uh, doing a bit of a, a chant. In this one, 
it just goes straight to Anna and Elsa. By the way, Jan Elsa, very good. Very good. Uh, very good job. No reason why I'm saying that at all. Moving on. So, anyway, they play around and Anna gets headshotted. Um, it is worth mentioning, actually, that this musical established that Elsa's not the only person in the world with powers, considering that the King Rock Troll asks her parents if she was born or cursed, meaning that they've dealt with people with magical powers before. Uh, he cl he's, obviously, he's able to fix the, the headshot, which, by the way, is pretty serious, because, well, with magic and all that, it, it, tends to mess with people, apparently. So he ended up erasing or changing all of her memories involving the powers so that the wound doesn't come up. And he mentions that it's kind of lucky that she got hit in the head because if she got hit in the heart, that's a lot more difficult to fix. Although it does imply that actually getting hit in the head is, like, the second worst place to get hit. Which, I mean, fair enough. But anyway, when Elsa asks... Elsa then asks him if, she, if he can take away her powers because she doesn't want to do that again. He mentions that he can't, which brings up an interesting thing. The rock trolls, which, by the way, are a lot more badass-looking in the in this version than in the movie because in the movie they're like they kind of remind me of like those tr those troll toys remember the ones with like the crazy hairstyles that are like twice their actual body height yeah they kind of reminded me of those my friend who saw with me described it described the musical versions as actually being scary but i liked it it was cool it looked cool so anyway, yeah, so they met, They make it clear that they have dealt with this stuff before, but that they can't take away her powers entirely. But I, I question, like, they could have still trained her and taught her how to control her powers. They definitely would have been better equipped for training than her parents, who have absolutely no experience in this sort of thing, at least as far as I know. And yeah, in my notes I'd, I'd restated that Yanana was good. No, no reason why I'm mentioning that. Anyway, the effects were very well done, but, or the visuals rather, uh, but honestly with a Disney budget I have come to expect that. If anybody has the money to make amazing visual spectacle, it's Disney. I do, however, I'm not going to go too much into the visuals of it all, because even though it's all very stunning to watch, I don't consider the spectacle, I actually consider spectacle to be, like, the least important part of a story. But anyway, yeah. Anna then spends her years spending time with herself, curing her own boredom, just wanting to spend time with her sister. Elsa spends her years trying to control her powers in order to keep everyone safe, including Anna. Both of them are motivated by their love for each other. I wonder if I'm bringing this up for some reason. And this is all shown in the song for the first time in forever, which obviously is a song that came from the movie. And even when I saw the movie first, which was like yonks ago, I actually reckon First Time in Forever is the best song in the original movie. Because it shows the two sisters heading towards the same path, but with differing goals and attitudes. Anna's excited for people to be coming to the castle for the first time in years, and to be seeing her sister at long last, while Elsa is seeing this as her biggest hurdle to clear. She's anxious over it, as she might jeopardise years of work and tribulations if anything goes wrong, and it's because of this that the two of them actually share very similar lines with each other at different points. Both of them at, diff at pretty much right, like, right after each other, 
mention the line, it's agony to wait. For both of them, this agony is very different. I always like it when songs do that, particularly musicals, when they take two characters that have different goals or different motivations, and they somehow manage to mesh things together in that way. It's really nice. I really like this number. Anyway, uh, what's happening at this point is that Elsa... Oh, also I forgot to mention that during the song Do You Want to Build a Snowman, which is also in the original movie, uh, Anna and Elsa's parents go off to find uh, something to do with Elsa's powers and they die in the shipwreck. So, parents are dead and Elsa, being the oldest sister, is next in line for the throne, but obviously can't get it until she's actually old enough. So, she gets old enough, and for the first time in forever is set just before her coronation, when she will finally be officially proclaimed Queen of Arendelle the kingdom that they're in. In the movie, Rapunzel and Flynn uh, from Tangled get to make a nice cameo, so that's cool. Anyway, um, yeah. Then, Anna's dancing around, having living her life, and then she runs into Hans, Prince Hans, of the Southern Isles. They have a bit of... They talk about each other, talk about their upbringing. Hans is the 13th son of a, the king of the Southern Isles, and Anna mentions how she hasn't seen her sister face to face in ages, and anyway, one thing leads to another, they end up proposing to each other. Yes, they have met, uh, that very day, but you know what? It's like they say, love is an open door, you can do whatever. So yeah, they're engaged now. And here we get a conflict of ideologies on love. Which is basically Anna versus everyone else in regards to their perspectives of love. Elsa, at first, claims you can't marry a man you've just met, while Anna claims you can if it's true love. Both sisters were extremely sheltered in their childhood, but while Elsa was taught to be extremely cautious at all times because of her powers, Anna wasn't. And as such, she became naive, showing the difference between the two. It's a nice contradiction. They were brought up in very similar ways, but they still ended up with very different personalities because the slight differences of their upbringing that happened were actually pretty significant. Anyway, just a bit of a detour. Anna and Hans push Elsa a little bit too hard. She ends up revealing that she has ice powers and everyone's like, ah, witch. And so then she runs away. So, thanks Anna, you ruined everything. Anyway, we then meet an ice farmer named uh, Kristoff and his pet reindeer, Sven. And I will say, actually, the puppet for Sven was actually pretty cool. It was also really funny whenever I looked at Sven, and he just had these cold, dead eyes. That's always nice. But yeah, they managed to put some pretty good personality into it. Also, just a quick question. Um, this story is set in Denmark. Denmark is a very northern place, where it's very cold, and it snows a lot. How important would an ice farmer be in a place like that? That's what I'm wondering. I could understand an ice farmer in like... Oh, unless they're actually exporting the ice to countries that need it more. Like the Wiki Wiki Wa Wa West. Maybe. Maybe that's what's happening. Although, uh, whatever. Not important. Anyway. Kristoff runs into Arna, who's gone off to try and find Elsa, and has left Hans in charge of the kingdom. A lot of faith being put into someone that she's just met, but, you know, she is naive, so makes sense. Anyway, Kristoff reaffirms Elsa's statement about love by stating that Arna knows nothing about love, which we get to see 
in the song that is called... What do you know about love? Uh... I lost where I was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she knows nothing about love, because obviously Anna's lived a life in lockdown, which can definitely have an impact on how one interacts with other humans, as we found. Anna rebuts this by stating that Kristoff knows nothing about love, since he seems to only spend his time with a reindeer, which can definitely have an impact on how one interacts with other humans. The way this son is blocked out as well, with Kristoff being like, you know, I'm experienced, I'm an experienced ice climber, I know my way around the frozen wasteland, you don't, come along with me and I will show you the way. Um... They, at some point, so during the song, the blocking that's happening at this point is Kristoff is using, like, an ice pick and a rope to climb a cliff where, and drops the rope down t so that Anna can get up more easily, but Anna decides to just climb a mountain herself with her bare hands. The way the song's blocked out or and performed makes it seem like Anna's philosophy is right, since her way of getting up the mountain actually works. She succeeds despite not listening to Kristoff, or possibly even because she didn't listen to Kristoff. This might be a thematic oversight, as we find out, or it might be a deliberate red herring. Who knows? I'm inclined to believe that it is a deliberate red herring. Anyway, they head along and they run into a living snowman, which would traumatize people. Nah, just kidding. He's the cute sidekick. The cute animal sidekick who isn't really an animal, but, you know, whatever, potato, potato. And Olaf turns out that he was created many, many years ago by Elsa and Anna back when they were kids and still allowed to see each other. A living snowman. And he has a song that's all about what he would do in the summer. Uh, yeah, in summer. Despite the fact that, you know, as a snowman, he is made of snow. And people do not exactly, yeah. Uh... Well, I mean, if you know anything about science and water, is that snow doesn't really, uh, work well with heat. He doesn't seem to know that, though. He loves the summer. Even though... Well, you know. He doesn't know that, though. Anyway. We see, we then cut to Hans and him trying to, like, calm everybody down back at Arendelle. And we see him being a very competent leader, rallying the people, giving them hope, even vouching for Anna and Elsa when others were ready to abandon them. This paints Hans as being a genuinely nice guy, considering the fact that he's very nice and altruistic, even when nobody important is around. And he does things that really aren't beneficial to him if he were a villain. I wonder if I'm bringing that up for some reason. Oh, also, I forgot to mention, I think I like Olaf in the musical better than the movie. He's another puppet and he's manipulated by a guy actually on stage. I don't know, he just seems a bit more endearing in the musical than he did in the movie. Although, he does have a pretty nice, uh... He does have a pretty nice joke that I reckon was nice and dark, where I think Kristoff is like, ow, oh, like, my skull's killing me, and Kristoff's just like, oh, and uh, Olaf's just like, I don't have a skull, or bones for that matter. So, where are we going? I don't know. Dark humour, yay. Anyway, then... At this point, we've reached the end of Act 1. We've reached the Act 1 finale. And 
Of course, the Act 1 finale is going to be Let It Go. Like, of course. I mean, I will say, though, it's it's an interesting villain song about the main character throwing away everything she strived for, for her own self-gratification. And... Oh, what's that? Or did you think that I was going to talk about how empowering the song is? Nah, 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 because it ain't. It ain't, son. Now, whenever the song comes up in conversation, which in my group of friends actually doesn't happen that often. I always ask why, like, out of all the songs in Frozen, why was this the one that became super popular? Everyone says that it's a super empowering song, but it's actually more of a villain song, which makes sense considering that Elsa was originally going to be the villain of the story. For those of you who don't know, this story is loosely based on Hans Christian Andersen's 1844 story, The Snow Queen. In that story, the titular Snow Queen, who obviously is Elsa, lives in a castle made of ice and kidnaps a boy named Kai and his friend Gerda travels there to rescue him. I probably butchered that pronunciation. Also, if the idea of a Snow Queen kidnapping a boy sounds familiar, well, uh, just before you draw any parallels, this book actually, this story actually came out before The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was originally published in 1950. This one was published over a hundred years prior to that, so, yeah, Narnia was definitely inspired by the Snow Queen. Anyway, Disney had been trying to do a Snow Queen adaptation since the 40s, but for one reason or another, it never came to be. There's even concept art out there somewhere of a cancelled, hand-drawn version of it. And when they finally started on actual pre-production of Frozen and had the first script, it was very different from what it is now. Anna was to be married to Hans and crowned queen, and an evil Elsa felt it was her birthright as she was the firstborn, but she had been exiled because of her powers. Elsa was going to kidnap Anna and freeze her heart. Then the last act was going to be Anna trying to finish the wedding and kiss Hans to thaw her heart, while Elsa tried to prevent it attacking with an army of evil snowmen. Obviously, a lot of those ideas still stayed in the original, in the final version, rather. They all, they also already had the idea that what would thaw Anna's heart in the end would have been sibling love instead of romantic love, with Elsa becoming good at the end. Oh wait, crap, I spoiled it. Anyway, the big change to the story came when the song Let It Go was completed and presented to Disney. The song was meant to be when Elsa was exiled from the kingdom, but when hearing it, they started to really think how would have Elsa's life been? How would it have been to grow up with a power you can't understand or control, and being isolated from everyone you know and love because of it? That changed the character from a strong and vengeful woman to a more complex and vulnerable one. Elsa's motivation went from vengeance to fear. Basically, Let It Go made them rewrite the first part of the movie to reflect that. They also added Kristoff and Sven to support Anna, so there's that. But yeah, you can definitely tell that in the lyrics. The lyrics clearly didn't change in Let It Go. And it paints Elsa in a really selfish light. I mean, the song starts in F minor, but then progresses to A flat major, I'm assuming by the first chorus. You would just need to keep the song in minor key, and you would pretty much already have a villain song right then and there. Anyway, so that finishes Act 1. And then, Act 2, we get introduced to this... Uh, this salesman who has basically no relevance in the movie, but 
uh, he actually gets his own song in this one. It opens up Act 2, and we, in that song, we get taught a little bit of Scandinavian culture with the concept of hygge, which is basically a word that means... It's a word in, I believe, Danish and Norwegian culture that means cosy and comfortable living with feelings of wellness and contentment. It's nice that we get a bit of a culture lesson from an entire family tree of eccentric sauna dwellers. I bring this up because I know I would have been lynched if I didn't include the son. Anyway, eventually, Anna, Kristoff, Sven, and Olaf make it to Elsa's castle. And Anna gets everyone else to leave the room while she has a one-on-one -on -one with Anna, uh, Elsa. <clears throat> anyway, so here's the thing. We then get the song I Can't Lose You, a duet with Anna and Elsa in it. Originally, in the original version of the musical, and also in the movie, the song that plays at this point in the movie is uh, a reprise of the first time for the first time in forever. Instead, so, and yeah, that was originally in the first few re productions of the musical, but then come February two thousand and twenty. Uh, they decided to change the song for some reason. They decided to make an entirely different song, completely original to the musical, to replace it instead. And I will say, I reckon that was a pretty good addition. I Can't Lose You might be my favourite musical exclusive song. It shows the two sisters, who have led very different journeys, both fighting for the same goal, that being the protection of their sister, in a pretty interesting light. Anna goes on a perilous journey to save her sister, and Elsa runs away to protect her sister. In the end, Elsa strikes Anna's heart, which is pretty bad, as we know from the beginning of the story, so Kristoff rushes to the rock trolls who raised him and Sven, which is actually referenced in the beginning of the story, where the Queen Rock Troll says, like, oh, we love kids, we even picked up a few strays ourselves. Anyway, we then get to see more of the best character in the entire musical, the Elder Rock Troll. Ya boy is ripped AF in this musical. Alright, so, here's the thing. Right, in the movie, he's small, and he's shaped like a rock. Here, he is carved like a rock. I saw a poster with him in the musical, like, outside the theatre, and initially I thought that they were advertising for a Tarzan musical, but no! Nope! We got Tarzan the Rock Troll! I ship him! Not with any character in particular, or anyone, I just ship him. Then we get the song Fixer Upper, which has always annoyed me. The song has always annoyed me, even when I first heard it in the movie. Because, I think mostly because they're having this big son and dance number, and I'm just sitting here like, Bruh, she's dying here. Just shut up and listen to Kristoff. But then in the musical, he tries to get them to listen to him, and then he starts joining in on the fun, joining in on the dancing and the singing, and he seems to forget that Anna's dying, and he's like, Ah! And then, at the end, the rock troll's like, Oh, why didn't you tell us? And I'm just like, Bruh! What do you... Ugh. Anyway, it turns out that a strike to the heart is pretty, pretty bad. The only way that she can actually be saved is to have an act of true love. They take... They interpret this as being, you know, a true love's kiss, obviously. So... Kristoff goes off to find Hans, who he knows that she and Hans have a thing for each other. So she goes to. So he takes her back to the castle to find Hans. Anyway, meanwhile, Hans has gone with a small group of people to try and capture Elsa, to try and bring her to justice, you know? 
and try and, you know, stop her from endangering other people. And we get a song from Elsa that's called Monster, which might also be my favourite musical exclusive song. It shows Elsa's internal monologue and shows through the song why she actually decides to surrender in the end. Obviously, this is replay In the movie, Elsa actually has a full-on fight with the people who go to her. Obviously, they couldn't have a full-scale fight scene with ice flinging all over the place, because that would have been very difficult to do. Would have been cool, but it would be very difficult to do. So they had a son instead, which I reckon works nicely. Anyway... They get Anna to Hans, and she explains the situation to him, and he's very, he's, like, very happy to see her, actually. Uh, so, yeah, she needs a true love kiss to survive, and Hans goes to kiss her, but stops himself, saying, Oh, Anna, if only there was someone who loved you. And this is where we discover that Hans is actually evil. Now... I've had a problem with this. This happens in the movie as well. You remember when I had said that originally Anna was married to Hans and Elsa was the villain? Well, I guess when they decided to make Elsa more of a sympathetic character, they were like, oh wait, we need an antagonist. So they just made Hans the an antagonist. I have a lot of problems with Hans. I think he's a pretty bad villain, to be honest. And I don't mean, like, one of those bad villains who is, like, you love to hate them. Like Scar, or Jafar, or Ursula. Hans, I think he's a pretty badly written villain. I won't get into... I won't really get into it now. I might dedicate a full video to it at another point. But, uh, just for now, I'll just say one of the problems I have with him is what I was kind of foreshadowing before. He goes from being this genuinely nice guy with absolutely no hints of him having ulterior motives to becoming a cartoonishly evil villain with, complete with, like, Bond villain level monologues and cliched lines like for example when he's about to leave the room Anna's like you'll never get away with this and Hans is like oh I already have it's like bruh like could you get more cliched than that also he becomes a total sadist who just loves committing evil acts now the thing is as far as I'm concerned you can't have a twist villain that's that cartoonishly evil because he is a twist villain anyway um that's all i'm gonna say about hans i could say more but i won't the point is that from this we find out that elsa and Kristoff's perspective of love was actually correct and anna's naivety and stubbornness very nearly got her killed anyway they then try to find Kristoff who seems to be a better shot now of a sh sign of true love, but before they can do anything, she sees Hans about to kill Elsa, and Anna jumps in the way. This is in the song... This is shown in the song... Uh... Colder by the Minute. Anyway, the way that they show Anna... jumping in the way, and freezing over is actually really clever i reckon the ensemble swarms anna and then she like stretches her arm out in the way of hans's sword as the projections display an ice effect on this wall of people that i reckon was r really clever and that whole sequence uh in colder by the minute where the four main characters are all searching for each other, I reckon is really well done. Anyway, Elsa cries over Anna's sacrifice, and then Anna starts to thaw out. The act of true love was one that Anna performed herself, an act of sisterly love. 
And this brings me to something I discovered about the different types of love, which is kind of important to this story. So, the Greeks have eight different types of love, apparently, that can be divided into three different categories. Love between friends, love between family, and love between a significant other, or love between significant others. The significant other love includes, I'm going to botch the pronunciations, but the significant other love includes pragma, which is enduring love, eros, which is romantic or physical love, and lusus, uh, playful love. The friend's love includes philia, not what you think it is. It's uh, like an affectionate love, uh, which obviously can be like a platonic type of love. Storge, uh, familiar love, which also involves familiar love, which is also part of family love. And philautia, uh, self-love. The most significant for this show is the love among family, which also includes storge and philia, as well as agape. I'm gonna get lynched. Uh, which is selfless love. Then you also have mania, which is obsessive love, but that one's considered an inherently bad thing, unlike the other seven. I bring this up because Frozen is a princess movie by Disney that subverts the idea of romantic love being the thing that saves the day, but sisterly love instead. Which I think, I think would be, like, just looking at the definitions of those types, it would be philia. Again, not what you think it is. Anyway, Elsa then realizes that love was the solution to her freezing problem, and used love to thaw everything instead of fear. We're getting some Donnie Darko love versus fear stuff going on him, going on here. Anyway, the story, the musical finishes with a beautiful Danish hymn, which is called Wet Welje, uh, which you might recognize from the Frozen 2 trailer, because I heard it in that, and I loved that track. So Welje, it's great. And that's the story. So, what morality does this story show, and how well does it hold up? Well, I think it's pretty obvious what this stuff is. First of all, one of the main morals is that to fall in love with someone you've just met is naive and setting yourself up for failure. Comparing Hans, who Anna basically fell in love with over the span of a few minutes, and decided that she was going to marry him, not unlike Bella from Twilight, actually, as opposed to Kristoff, who she actually spent more proper quality time with, and they actually went on a full-on quest together. Generally, I'd say this is a good message to send to kids, but I wonder... Because people say that this acts as a criticism of Disney tropes in regards to the whole love at first sight thing, because it rejects love at first sight. But does it come up that often in Disney movies? Most romances in Disney movies, particularly the later ones, involve romances in relationships that gradually developed over the course of the story. Rapunzel and Flynn Rider in Tangled are a terrific example of that. They have a... They both have their own individual goals and are forced together by circumstance. They go on a full-on quest together. In the process, they fall in love with each other. And their dreams and goals change because of each other. It's great. And that's why I reckon Tangled is a brilliant story. I'd say it's definitely at least one of the better Disney movies out there. One of the best, I would say. The main moral... But yeah, the main moral taught in this story is obviously the power of familial love, specifically sisterly love, which might be a bit alienating if you don't have a sister, but whatever. 
It's good that they explored other forms of love and showed that sibling love can be just as strong as romantic love. In some places, like Alabama, they might even be synonymous. It's nice and it makes sense to this that this morality would hold up today because it's such a recent show, they would accommodate to the times. They had been looking a lot more at thing at stories other than love stories. Frozen these days is praised by a lot of people for subverting Disney tropes, but at the same time holds on to those tropes a lot tighter than some may think. The whole love con Stuff like love conquers all, sure, sisterly love, but they still have the theme of love conquers all. The funny sidekick is everyone's favourite character, and they even get a romantic love story in there despite the main story, despite the main moral of the story. The morality applies to modern day, but it doesn't subvert Disney tropes as much as some think. I'll let you guys decide whether you think that's a good or a bad thing. But anyway, I've been going for 41 minutes now. I think that's a good time to stop. But anyway, hope you guys enjoyed listening to this. And until then, have a good one.